Restore the Snyderverse. On October 5th, there was a huge uptick in the hashtag of Restore the Snyderverse on Twitter. Now, this hashtag is nothing new. It was a follow-up to the Release the Snyder Cut hashtag that happened at some time after the Justice League movie that was released in 2017. The Snyder Cut was eventually released on March of 2021. It premiered on HBO Max. So why was there a rise of the hashtag Restore the Snyderverse? Well, it was all because of a small segment of an HBO European launch video featuring the president of Warner Media Europe, Priya Dagra. She referred to Zack Snyder's Justice League as a global phenomenon. That was it. No announcement from HBO Max or Warner Brothers Studios about a Justice League follow-up. It was just one mention of Zack Snyder's Justice League being a global phenomenon. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Not to risk the ire of the Snyderverse fanboys calling for my cancellation. <laughs> it's a fun idea. Nobody really watches my channel outside my immediate friends and family, mostly some co-workers. Love you guys. I do want to ask a question. Does the Snyderverse need restoring? No, wait. Let me get to my reasoning. Is it possible that what makes the Snyderverse so special is because it's rare? It's one of those gems that didn't get to live up to the potential it showed, and thus, the tiny bit that we got is more wonderful for it. This is an unpopular stance, and I don't even know if I subscribe to it, but it is a valid point. So, how did we get here? How did we get to the point where Twitter has been the voice of a generation of nerds trying to influence a studio into restoring a vision of the DC Universe that Zack Snyder had created? Well, it goes back to 2013 with Man of Steel, a reboot of Superman starring Henry Cavill. The movie did a total of 60, don't know, 668 million at the box office and had mixed to average reviews. One complaint of the movie was the darker tone for The Man of Tomorrow. People thought Superman killing was a little bit too much. You know that. Anyway, Man of Steel was followed, about, followed up by the 2016 movie Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Cavill returned as Superman slash Clark Kent and was added by Ben Affleck playing probably the most comic book accurate physically version of Batman there's ever been on film. Believe it or not, early buzz on the movie was very positive. Rumor had it, Warner Brothers executives were so impressed by their early cut of the film, they gave it a standing ovation. But as we saw, the film film's approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes ended up at around like 29%. Some of the same complaints of Batman v Superman were the same as Man of Steel. Too dark, too violent. And Batman was prone to killing his adversaries, which is, well, kind of a no-no, especially if you read the comics. Dark Knight really doesn't kill. That's not his thing. In fact, he's pretty against it. Anyway, I saw the movie and I agree with some of the complaints. Also, I don't know what the heck they did to Lex Luthor. I can see making a sort of like Mark Zuckerberg type, but if this was the case, they should have just had Jesse Eisenberg do the same performance for Lex that he did on The Social Network. I mean, really, The Social Network's Mark Zuckerberg was more Lex Luthor than Lex Luthor in BVS. But one thing that was pretty much universally praised was the casting of Gal Gadot as the Amazonian princess Diana Prince, a.k.a. Wonder Woman. Her portrayal of the classic hero was, well, quite a breath of fresh air. She was the perfect Wonder Woman. And when they made her introduction in the fight scene with the proper Wonder Woman uniform, it was quite awesome. You know, with that background music doing the da -na -na -na. So metal. The film was also setting up a shared universe beyond the Holy Trinity of DC. Characters like The Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg all had cameos in the film. It was clear they were setting up the Justice League. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind was Warner Brothers was trying to replicate the success of MCU, but taking a shortcut. Instead of the Justice League having origin stories for all its participants, they wanted to jumpstart it with the Justice League and do the origin story movies afterwards. It was actually kind of a unique approach, but ultimately didn't give the audience a sense of investment like they did with the phase one MCU projects. But in comparison to studios like Sony with the amazing Spider-Man and Universal trying to set up a dark universe of all things with court, uh, excuse me, classic horror icons, Warner Brothers attempt probably succeeded better than most. Oh, just an aside, what if the theory about Pixar taking place in one universe is accurate and they have like an Avengers style movie with all the characters. Oh my God, that would be so amazing. Anyway, the lukewarm reaction to BVS sent the studio into panic mode and they tried to course correct pretty quickly. The immediate project felt was David Ayer's Suicide Squad, the 2016 version. Now, this was kind of problematic in the beginning because Ayers was given about six weeks to get the script together before shooting. The first trailer of the movie seemed to be very much in line with Zack Snyder movies. It was dark with a bleak tone, which totally fits a movie about a super-powered Dirty Dozen style movie. Rumor has it the first cut of the movie was exactly in the same tone as the trailer. But again, the executives of Warner Brothers decided to meddle and hired a company named Trailer Park. Get it? Because they edit movie trailers. So they hired this company to re-edit Ayer's movie to resemble more of a Guardians of the Galaxy vibe. The funny part is, six years later, they hired Guardians director and writer James Gunn to film the reboot slash sequel of The Suicide Squad. Ultimately, they had two edits of the same movie, so they just edited them both together into one horrible excuse of a movie. That's why it was so disjointed and awful. One of the more polarizing decisions they made was casting Oscar winner and frontman for 30 Seconds to Mars, Jared Leto as the Joker. I'll say in my totally not expert opinion is that what we saw in the movie was not great, but Leto could have been the greatest Joker ever, and we wouldn't know because of the horrible fucking editing they did. Leto once remarked that there was enough unused footage for him to do an entire Joker movie. <laughs> yeah, an entire Joker movie. That would never work. Hmm. The movie did do a respectable 400 and or excuse me, 746 million worldwide box office, but was very much considered a critical failure. There was a few standouts though, especially Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, Will Smith's Deadshot, and the legendary Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. She's so good. So the executives, did they learn anything about their meddling? Probably nothing. Or if they did, they totally took away the wrong lesson because now we move into the Justice League. Filming of the Justice League began on April 11th, 2016, and Zack Snyder was still at the helm. This was originally supposed to be a multi-part saga, like a trilogy, but the negative reaction to the DCEU ended up having the executives change their plans. The original Snyder and Chris Terrio script expounded on many of the elements that we saw in BVS and eventually in the Snyder cut of the film. This includes an evil Superman and a showdown between the biggest bad of the DC Universe Darkseid and our heroes. If things had been different, we may have had some of those things in the theatrical version of the movie. But in March of 2017, Zack Snyder's daughter Autumn passed away and Zack very understandably stepped away from the Justice League. The director of the 2012 Avengers and Avengers Age of Ultron and the creator of Firefly and the Buffyverse, Joss Whedon stepped in to take over the production of the movie. At this point, the film had been shot 
and was in post-production. And I'm not going to lie, at the time, I was pretty excited for Whedon taking control of the movie because I loved the Avengers and I even liked Age of Ultron. I understood why Zack left, but I thought Joss was going to hit it out of the park like it did with the first Avengers and boy was I wrong. Joss put $25 million worth of reshoots into the film and Warner Brothers CEO at the time, Kevin Kevin Chushara, maybe? I'm sorry, I, I don't know the pronunciation of it. Um, mandated the movie be under two hours. Now, of course, we know that's a mistake now because we've all seen the Zack Snyder Justice League. But bringing the cast back for these reshoots was a little problematic because Cavill was already shooting one of the Mission Impossible movie, movies. Paramount Pictures put Henry under contract not to shave his mustache. The FX team at Warner Brothers assured the audience they could fix it in post. <laughs> well, we know how that went. Oddly enough, it served as like a reference point to all the Superman scenes that were reshot because Superman had a weird upper lip. Some of it was kind of, it was pretty jarring. Another concern was Ben Affleck. Um, after watching BVS and the Justice League, in my opinion, Ben was just phoning his performance in. And after watching the Snyder Cut, I can see why Affleck would have ended up doing a Batman movie. Uh, that was the plan. But he stepped away from it um, after the theatrical cut of the Justice League. Ironically, he did come back for more reshoots for the Zack Snyder version. Now, I saw the theatrical version of the Justice League on opening night. I was doing a training up in Seattle. And what I remember was the audience reaction was pretty good. Most everybody left feeling pretty good about the movie, as far as I can tell. Thinking back on it, I think the reason was probably just seeing an event like that. You know, all the DC heroes, all the big ones. Now, one thing I'll say, though, is like movies like Man of Steel and even BVS, I've watched them a few times. I've never watched the theatrical version of the Justice League again, not since I saw it in the theater. And it's not due to any sort of protest. I just, I guess I didn't want to. The movie did have some bright spots, mainly Gal Gadot, Jason Momoa, and Ray Fisher as Cyborg. And even though Cyborg wasn't a central character, Fisher was able to do a lot with it. Of course, the badness of the movie is too numerous to count, but I'll say a couple of them. Superman's upper lip and Steppenwolf as the villain, or at least that interpretation of Steppenwolf. It really didn't make much sense. The Justice League made about a total of 657 million worldwide, which is about on par with Man of Steel, but they had a much bigger budget with the reshoots. And this series of complicated events pretty much shut the door on any future Justice League movies. Later that year, Wonder Woman uh, debuted and was directed by Patty Jenkins. And oddly enough, it had a really good critic and audi audience scores. Wonder Woman's box office numbers were awesome at $821 million. And aside from a weak third act, it was a damn good movie. And then Momoa's 2018 Aquaman movie did even better at the box office, cracking the billion dollar mark. One billion, one hundred and forty-eight million to be exact. Granted, Aquaman didn't have the critical response that Wonder Woman did, but it was still considered a great success. Shazam came out the following year and kind of underperformed at the box office, but had a great critical response, 90% 90, 90 on Rotten Tomatoes. And even though the movie only pulled in $366 million worldwide, it made the studio a net profit of $74 million due to the lower budget over films like BVS and definitely the Justice League. Aside from Shazam, what do Wonder Woman and Aquaman have in common? Well, cinematically, they are both the creations of Zack Snyder. 
Zach sought out Jason Momoa for the role of Arthur Curry, and he cast Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman way back in BVS. So some of the elements of the Snyderverse were very successful, and both projects did well, probably mainly due to little or no studio interference. Studio interference seems to be the downfall of Warner Brothers, but they just can't seem to help themselves on it. Now, I don't know when it started, but in November of 2019, Snyder started alluding to his cut of the Justice League movie, movie via Twitter. These tweets were a little cryptic, but they were soon followed by Gal Gadot and Ben Affleck with the hashtag of Release the Snyder Cut. This of course took Twitter by storm and in May of 2020, the impossible happened. We had confirmation that a Snyder Cut did exist and moreover would be released on HBO Max in 2021. Wow, what the shit. It actually did premiere content for their streaming service. Disney Plus had The Mandalorian. Hulu had The Handmaiden's Tale. So HBO Max needed their version of The Mandalorian and they decided it would be Zack Snyder's Justice League. So what was Zack Snyder's Justice League like? Well, if you've seen that version of the movie, you already know. But I will say it was amazing. And what what a little time away from the franchise can do. Justice League was still dark and bleak and not to mention four hours long, but it was awesome. It was truly freaking awesome and so different than the version that Whedon did. Zack even set up a sequel with an end scene with his Batman, Batfleck to be precise, and the Jared Leto Joker. Now apparently he did this because he wanted these versions of Batman and the Joker to interact at least once in the DCEU in case they never got a chance to do it again. And I will say it totally vindicated my belief that Leto was a good Joker, but the Suicide Squad butchered it by horrible editing. Butchered his performance, I mean. All in all, this was a wonderful version of the movie that the fans thought would never see. HBO Max gave $50 million to Snyder, and even Ben Affleck returned for shooting, like I said earlier. Also, Affleck looked good. Like, really good. Like, better than BVS shape. In a way, the whole way this transpired can be almost of a blessing in disguise. If Zack Snyder had stayed on the film in 2017, we never would have gotten in this version. Warner Brother would want to cut the film down to probably two hours, but I don't think Snyder knows how to do that. So we could have ended up with a two and a half to two hours and 45 minute mark. And that would be just awful after seeing what Snyder had visioned. Also this time, nobody meddled with this movie and it turned out terrific. So that was March of 2021, and to date, there's nothing that really has come of the Snyderverse moving forward. The Zack Snyder version of the Justice League really didn't drive up subscriptions as HBO Max had hoped, but it sure did buy a ton of goodwill with the fanboys and girls. The James Gunn Suicide Squad premiered on HBO Max along with Wonder Woman 84. Now, this was done because of the global pandemic that is COVID. Um, Wonder Woman 84 was a bit of a disappointment, mainly due to the fact that nobody really wants to think of Diana Prince of Themyscira as being a sexual predator. Wait, do you think I'm wrong? Well, the owner of the body, now his name is Handsome Guy. He has no name, just Handsome Guy. Chris Pine's character took it over, okay? But it was Handsome Guy that had physical relations with Wonder Woman. Handsome Guy could not consent. So there you go. Okay, where was I? Oh yeah, the Suicide Squad. James Gunn's Suicide Squad did well, critic-wise, with a 90% rating on the tomato meter on Rotten Tomatoes. Again, both projects spun either directly or indirectly out of the Snyderverse. Now, with the critical success of Zack Snyder's Justice League and the critical and financial success of the spin-off movies from the universe he had created, one would think Warner Brothers would be quick to sign Zack Snyder back to them, right? Well, not exactly. And they really didn't pursue him back to Warner Brothers. This is where it gets weird. 
see there is a warner brothers studio that does the movie content and then there is warner media and they're not the same thing warner brothers studios really did not have an interest in the snyderverse but warner media did warner media owns hbo max and they are the ones that did the deal with Snyder for his cut of the Justice League. So if the DCEU or Snyderverse is restored, it will be because of Warner Media and not Warner Brothers Studio. Weird, right? It's like some sort of weird inception thing. I don't know. Recently, Warner Brothers and Discovery have merged, bringing, and I kid you not, the title of Warner Brothers Discovery. Right now, Warner Media is owned by AT&T, and they wanted Warner Media to beef up their streaming bundles like DirecTV and AT&T, this or that, who knows? They, they got like 30 of them. But I think it's pretty clear that AT&T wants to go back to being a telecommunications company and not a streaming media provider. Again, like I said, the new platform will be called Warner Brothers Discovery. And it's possible the Snyderverse might live on through that means. But again, here's the question. Do we need the Snyderverse restored? Now, personally, I would like it. Also, it seemed like Zack Snyder Justice League was intended to be a launching off point for a trilogy. So here's another question. Could it happen? Who knows? It might, it might not. A couple years ago, I would say probably not. But the Snyder Cut actually happened. And we kind of live in a brave new world where tweeting in mass can actually influence a studio. At least it did once. Hopefully it could restore the Snyderverse. Well, my friends, let's hope that it happens. And let's hope the studio doesn't get in Zack's way. If they have a plan for it and they want to do it soon, it may be announced at DC's fandom. Well, that's pretty much how all I have on the subject. But I did want to say one thing because I wasn't able to say it anywhere in this video. The Last Jedi was not a good movie. Anyway, fare thee well, my friends, and take care.